But actually, I've got an idea, Joel. Here's what we're going to do for the rest of this episode, okay? We're, this is, we're going to turn this into another versus episode. We're going uh, okay. we're gonna, to we're gonna turn this into a hacker versus developer episode. The right way and the wrong way? Yeah, <laughs> okay. and, and we're going to say, okay, Justin says this is a vulnerable code pattern. And Joel says, well, there's, there's a little bit of nuance to that situation. <laughs> there's a way to do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, real quick, I want to remind you about the Critical Thinking Discord community. There's been a ton of great activity on the chats lately. People just kind of shooting the breeze to drop in new hacking tips and advice, uh, sharing cool research, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's definitely something you're going to want to get in on if you haven't already. Also, we've got the subscriber tiers in place now, which will give you access to really cool things like Masterclass, AMA, uh, just random scripts that I drop. It's kind of like our inner circle. Um, so if you want to get in on that, please do. We would really appreciate it. Also, it helps support the show. So if you're interested in any of that, head over to ctbb.show slash discord to join the community today and we'll see you over there. All right, back to the show. Boom, boom, boom. We're rolling. Yo, yo, yo. How's it going? Pretty good, dude. Lots of, lots of busyness lately, prepping for this live hacking event coming up, trying to knock some critical thinking stuff out of the way, get some uh, you know, long-term projects finished up so I can get in the zone and do the hackity hackity. Yeah, same dude, same. I've been, uh, I've been trying to block out some time and, and get prepared and it's, uh, <laughs> everything's been coming at me sideways lately. So hopefully, yeah. hopefully it's all come down to. Hopefully so, hopefully so. Um, tell me a little bit about the scraping project you were doing, dude. Sorry, I just like I did get my breath breath straight there for a second. Um, tell me a little <laughs> bit about this uh, the scraping project you were doing, dude, because uh, you post about it on Twitter. Looks pretty cool. I want more data, man. It, it, it seems like a really good uh, a good place to do some bug bounty analytics. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was talking with Nagley. Um, I'm trying to pull up the data on my other computer here, really yeah. quick. Um, I was talking with Nagley about. Um, you know, it's just some sort of different program statistics that we could look at. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he mentioned was that we should take a look at 90 day total bounties paid. Um, and I think one of the areas where HackerOne doesn't do a great job of data, like visibility is sort of like program data visibility for hackers. Yeah. Um, so like there's no real way to sort of search or view this sort of data across all programs as a hacker. Um, I don't really think they have a good way, a good incentive to reveal that data, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably why. Um, but uh, so I wrote a quick little script that basically just like pulls all of my private programs and my public programs that I'm on. And it pulls down all the ones that have exposed their uh, total 90 day bounties. Some of them haven't. Um, and then basically just shows me them. Um, and it was really, really interesting, actually, the the data that popped up because it wasn't quite was it what I was expecting. I don't really know what I was expecting, to be honest. Um, but when I started to look at it, um, I mean, there's some really big discrepancies right off the bat. Um, I can't really name too many of these because I also don't know which one off the top of my head are pu public or private. Right, right. But what I will say uh, is kind of similar to what I, what I found in the tweet, which is that, um, you know, I, I'm on about 600 uh total public and private programs okay um it's not you know all of them it's not it's a pretty decent cohort but um uh, based on what yobert was saying in uh the replies it's probably about half of them um or maybe even wow. less than half um and so uh from the day that i have um about give or take 560 of them um show their total bounties uh, so, you know, 40 or 50 of them don't reveal it. Mm, Some of them, mm. I, I think one of the ones off the top of my head that doesn't do it, that's public. Let me just double check. Is not bad. Okay. I'm glad I didn't say it. Uh, it's not public. <laughs> that's it's, not public. it's not public. So, so there, okay, there are um, a couple of them that don't, don't reveal their 90 day bounty statistics, which I, I feel like yeah. that's kind of like... I don't know. That that's kind of a sketchy move, to be honest. Like, if you're not revealing your 90 day statistics, then I'm kind of a little bit like, eh, like, th why? Why are you doing that? Why are you yeah, hiding that? It it is a little bit weird. I'm not really sure what the motivation would be to hide that stat. Um, like, 
I don't know. I, I think one important thing to say is that like I don't want to put too much weight on this stat because we've talked about this before. Like I don't think programs really should be paying a lot of money. <laughs> like yeah, I think that's yeah. kind of a bad signal, right. if anything. So um, paying a lot of money is like pri- kind of a pro and a con. But um, I think from the hacker perspective, this is one of the things we care about because we want to see where programs are active and um, you know who's paying a lot uh, right now and. You know, maybe why are they paying a lot? Is there something that somebody's exploiting? All that kind of stuff. I think there's a lot of interesting um, sort of data points that you can pull out of it. Yeah. What, what are you thinking about doing with that data? Are you going to, you know, I know there was some talk of put, putting it into a bot or something like that, but I don't know. Would you do like a like a daily report or something like that of like, oh, there's been a bounty spike over on this program or, you know, something like that? Or what kind of ideas did you have for that? Yeah, that might be what I'd do. Like maybe... Maybe the right way to do this is to monitor for programs that um, have large spikes relative to their current or, you know, large payouts that are relative percentages to their overall bounties. Mm, mm. Um, that could be interesting. And and notify like, hey, this program just paid out like p- proportionally a large bounty uh, compared to what they have been paying or something like that. And then maybe that's an interesting place to take a look. Maybe they rolled out some features. Somebody found something and you could jump on that bandwagon. Yeah, I wish um, I wish uh, I wish it was more like the hacker one live hacking event leaderboard dude, where it's like <laughs> as soon as the bounty hits, like the total goes up and stuff like that. Because then you could do some <laughs> some stuff like, okay, you know, they just paid out. We know right now that they just paid out a fifty k bounty or something like that. Let's go, you know, check out this program because they're paying a lot of money. Yeah, um, right. So. Yeah, that that could definitely yeah. be interesting. I I definitely looking forward to see what you do with it. I I hope you you put it in the the CTVB Discord, man, because I think, I mean, you know, I've I've got some bots in there that I haven't fully released yet that I'm thinking about releasing. We'll see. We'll see if they keep on churning out bugs. I I don't know. It's I need some incentivization, but um, I've got some bots that that I I would like to to integrate, you know, into the community. And I think the statistic piece, the data scraping and, and analytics of hacker one programs could be really cool. Obviously you're going to have to find, you know, the ones that are just public and just do those. Um, or you can hash the name or something like that and salt it in some way or, or yeah. I, I don't know. It, it could be a little tricky, but yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so the other thing I, I wanted to mention was, um, when we were looking at like overall like numbers and stuff um Mm. like who's paying what and how much and all that kind of stuff one of the really interesting thing is um you know when we were looking at sort of like the total bounties paid by like programs under a certain threshold so first we were looking at like you know who's paid less than 10k or who's paid more than 10k um and when you look at like who's paid less than 10k it's 60 to 75 percent of programs um which man you'd think like wow okay that's not a lot. And even if you add up the totals, um, it, it isn't a lot. Like the I, all the programs that I'm on, again, like this is a, a, a smaller subset of all the programs, but of the programs that I'm on, uh, the ones who are paying less than 10K total about 12% of the total bounties over the last 90 days, again, out of my data that I have. And then the top 10 programs are accounting for like 50% of those. Bounties. Wow. So, you know, the top 10 are doing 50% of the bounties and everybody under 10K is doing 10% of the bounties. Um, and everybody under 10K is 75% of the total programs. So, you know, the top wow. 25 are doing 90% of the bounties. The top, sorry, the top 25% are doing 90% of the bounties. And the top 10 programs individually are doing 50%. Dude, um, sounds like uh, sounds like a, a chart of the you know wealth distribution in America or something like that. <laughs> you know, like like it's pretty it's pretty gnarly. But I mean, I guess we see those sort of systems in pretty much every environment where you know it, it's pretty much classic eighty twenty rule here of like you know the top twenty percent or in this case you know maybe the top not yeah, even five percent probably two percent uh, have have you know fifty percent of the bounties paid. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, absolutely. And so Yobert, Yobert followed up um, on my tweet and said that uh, it was pretty interesting data and that the data that I had scraped was actually about half of the full data. Mm. Mm. So I, 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 I said I was curious how much like how close my percentages were yeah. to like real world, real world, you know, if you scale it up sort of to the to the other half that I'm missing. Um, and he said directionally, it seemed correct. So that I, th- I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, mm. But he also mentioned this chart. I'm not good with 
you know, chart names as I know, like the basic ones, but he mm. mentioned it was a power law distribution. And um, I had looked mm. this up and it definitely seems like a pretty close representation where essentially like it's very, very, um, uh, you know, high sort of, you know, 80, 20, uh, basically yeah. like yeah. What, what you mentioned. I think it's the same thing. Um, the, the 80, 20 rule power law graph type, you know, yeah, so exactly. the ones where it, it does that like yeah, in the very steep, beginning it's very high and then steep it, drop. it steeply drops off. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That that's definitely that definitely represents the situation. So what kind of what kind of takeaways do you think you know hunters can can have from this? I mean, is the takeaway to focus on a big program if you really want to get a lot of money out of it? I don't know. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a couple of really interesting things. One one thing to remember is that. You know, like I said, 75% of programs right now are co cover accounting for about 10% of the bounties, which means that there's probably actually a lot more juice to be pulled from that area. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, okay. those top so the 10 programs. Intuition there. Okay. Right. Like the top 10 programs are paying 50% of the bounties, sure. Um, but like, you know, you could hack on those and you, you could get it. It really just shows that they have money. But mm -hmm. I think what what I'm more interested in is the fact that, you know, all of those programs that are paying 10K or less, um, one, they are paying 10K or less, right? So that's like still pretty significant bounties. Like, you know, maybe it's only a couple reports, um, but they have that kind of budget and they're paying it out. Mm -hmm. And secondly, there's a lot more programs in that cohort, right? So we're, we're talking about hundreds of programs who are paying, you know, 10K or less and... 10 programs who are paying hundreds of thousands, yeah. you know, in the, in the top 10. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess there's, there's a decent, a decent takeaway there as well as like, you can focus on these smaller programs. They're not even paying out that much right now. There's not a lot of competition on these guys. And so, you know, lower chance of dupes for sure, but it's a little bit, you know, there isn't as much of a track record of bounties being paid there. And so for me, that's a little bit more of the indicator. Like I'm less scared of dupes because my methodology is not as dupe centric, you know, dupe, dupable bug centric. Um, yep. And, and, you know, th that's obviously I'm looking for bugs that can be duped, you know, anyone can dupe my eye doors or, you know, anything like that. But like, um, I guess, for me, I, I kind of look for a program that has a set track record of paying money because I know that they are more likely to pay, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. ver versus programs that are like, don't have a track record, but maybe, you know, the competition isn't as severe. But I think that's also a function of being sort of towards the top of the game. Um, and if you're, uh, you know, a newer, a newer hacker, it might be better for you to focus on those smaller programs. Um, you know, make that program your niche, make that program your, your, your thing. Um, and then, you know, de develop a, a sense of presence of like, okay, I can make, you know, uh, three or $4,000 a month off this program. And then, you know, from there you can expand. Yeah. And, you know, it makes me think uh, I'll probably expand on the script a little bit and I'll start to look at some of the other data points as well that are available mm. from programs. So like maybe what's their average bounty over the last 90 days instead of just the total as well. Mm. Um, Cause if it's like, you know, let's say they paid a million dollars but the average bounty is 500. Mm. Well, you know, that says a lot. Um, you know, maybe That's they're just true. paying a lot of bounties and they're just a large program, but most of what everything's, people are finding are, everything's low. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And from like a hacker perspective, like I'm not really sure what the right conclusion to pull away from that is. It's like, should I, should you just hack on that and farm lows and mediums or, you know, and you know that they have a lot of scope or should you, you know, look for the programs that, you know, paid 15 K in the last 90 days and, they're just above sort of that threshold um, and they've got some decent bounties. Maybe they have some new scope or something. I, I don't know yet. I, I haven't really figured out the right way to make this sort of um, useful yeah, from a hacker I, perspective, but the data is there. And I think just generally speaking, like when I look at these list of programs, especially like the top 30, mm. um, you know, they're, they're, they're big programs that most people have heard of that, um, maybe, I mean, a lot of them have run live hacking events. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. I can read off some of them like number 17, Uber, uh, number, f number 15, GitLab. Sorry, I might have mm. to bleep that. I don't know if that one's public. That's fine. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll bleep the, that. The one that I, <laughs> that I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'll be easy to figure, <laughs> to figure out. <laughs> uh, number nine, Airbnb, um, Number 12, Yahoo. So, yeah, I mean, like a lot of these are like pretty big programs in sort of the top like 15. 
um, either like past live hacking event runners mm-hmm. or like current live hacking event runners. Um, some of them are private. Um, you, like you know, you know, I think you know the what? I'd, number I'd one kinda, program's a private one. You, you know what I'd kind of like to see, man, is maybe if we could find some way to show the distribution of vulnerabilities, a, a specific uh, vulnerability delegations that a, a program is paying out. So I want to know which program pays the most crits and which program pays mm. the most highs, you know, and which program plays the most mediums. I think that would be really valuable data. And pretty much the only way I can think of to do that is to try to correlate reputation increases on that program's leaderboard to severities. Does that make you sense? You could definitely do that. You think so? Yeah. So I think, yeah, yeah. So so the right the right way to do that is basically, I mean, it's tricky because you would you would miss certain you'd miss some things, but I think depending on how many programs you're on, you could definitely do it at scale. Mm. Um, so so the model would basically be like this: you have um, all your programs that you're on. You pull all those programs, and when you pull the programs, you pull their leaderboards with their top. 10 hackers. Mm. You take those 10 hackers, you pull their profiles with their stats. Mm. And then when the program gets uh, you, well, you'd have a to monitor bounty, the whole, or, you'd have to monitor yeah, have the to monitor whole everything. leaderboard. Yeah. Correct. Jeez. Correct. So when the program gets a new bounty, pay like when they pay out a new bounty, you check the leaderboard and you see who bumped on the leaderboard. Mm. If nobody bumped on the leaderboard, somebody who's not on the leaderboard, but maybe you could do it with the thanks tab or something. Something like that. We, we so we, um, we need to or or here's an idea. We could hit up Yobert and be like, "Hey, we want this. <laughs> could you could you please do this?" <laughs> that's another possibility because he's been cranking out stuff, you know. Uh, that's true. So that that's one option. I, I I think I think that would be much more telling, right? Like I want to yeah. hack on the program that pays the most crits. You know, like, yeah. like that would be that would be really cool. Um, and, and, and you know, we can tell from that that there's systemic issues that they consider to be highs or crits or mediums or whatever that yeah. continue to make themselves present. Um, mm. And so I think that would be a really valuable piece of information. Um, and, and you and you may be even able to correlate it with. Average yeah. bounty range. Uh, yeah, because yeah. you, you're just piecing together all these pieces of information because the average bounty range, you know, it, it gives you a specific percentile. And then you might be able to use like a model to extrapolate that data out to the rest of the bell curve or whatever. And and yeah. then and then map that onto the amount of bounties paid over the past 90 days. Yeah. So like for Tricky. example, mm. for example, number three in my list is PayPal, uh, public program. Um so yeah, I believe that PayPal <laughs> has paid 474k in the last 90 days. Um, their <laughs> average bounty range. Now the the interesting thing is I don't know I don't think average bounty range is actually 90 days. Is it? It's overall, right? Ah, uh, yeah. So that's that's even trickier because you're not getting data on your main number. Right. Yeah, because it says that their average bounty range is 1.9 to 4.1, which. It's probably right. It's like right in the middle of medium for them mm, for the mm. current table. Um, hmm. Interesting. But yeah, we'll have to we'll have to think through it. See if we can figure out a way to extra- extrapolate that data. Um, if any of you guys in the uh, in the listenership here have any ideas on what we could do with this data or um, ways to get that piece of data that I wanted to tell how many programs, uh, you know, how many crits or highs or mediums or whatever a program is paying definitely uh hop into the uh, critical thinking discord and drop drop us a note in the pod talk channel um about that because that would definitely be something that i think would be interested in releasing for the public yeah. um yeah i think there's there's hmm. definitely some other data points that we could you know pull from i'm not sure but i'll have to look i'll have to keep looking <laughs> joel, know, joel is <laughs> there's nothing this is a this is it's in my brain now we we nerd sniped joel live live on the pod and now he's just <laughs> staring mindlessly into his computer screen um no that's great man um all right well let's let's pivot away from that topic before you get in too deep and, and yeah. i can't pull you yeah. out um yeah. next thing that i wanted to talk about was the hacker notes launch um there's a little bit of an announcement uh we recently brought on grep me uh, a hacker by the name of grep me onto the critical thinking team he'll be our writer and uh he is going to be essentially listening to the podcast episode before it releases and then uh providing you all with a uh hacker tldr of sorts um and 
it's designed to be a little bit like Tim Ferriss's Five Bullet Friday. So it's just going to be five bullet points limited um, at, at the top of the, the blog post. And it's just going to note the most important things from that episode. And then um, it's going to take those, those most important things, elaborate on them a little bit, and then, you know, you can just take those and run. You know, you'll get a lot of the value out of, out of the episode if you just read those five bullet points. And then beneath that, he'll elaborate a little bit more on the content for those of you that um, prefer text-based mediums versus audio or maybe just can't get your, you know, maybe your headphones are dead or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> and you still want to get access to the information. Um, so that should be that should be really good. I'm looking forward to seeing how he continues to, to push that out. And I, I think particularly just the, the, the five bullet points will be helpful for people that don't have time to listen to the full episode. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited to see... Um you know, where this is going to go. We, we did a little bit of this with the blog cast, but I don't think it was really um, uh, targeted towards the right technical audience. So yeah. hopefully this is a little bit more of a technical approach, um, you know, sort of by uh, by hackers for hackers. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, we're, we definitely want to hear the feedback about this. So, um, you know, as you're reading through, the, through it, if you have any things you'd like to see more of, less of, anything you'd like changed, um, you know, give us a shout in the, in the Discord and we'd love to hear that sort of feedback. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And if you're interested in getting this uh, as a newsletter, um, you can sign up for that at ctvb.show uh, or on blog.criticalthinkingpodcast.io. Um, all right, with that, let's move on to the next news item. Technically, that was the news section. We didn't say that that was the news section. Uh, <laughs> we just kind of jumped right into it. But um, yeah, Joel, GitLab CVE man popped this past week. What's going on with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there was a really interesting. Uh, I think it came out on Twitter originally first. Um, yeah. I saw it like someone dropped pop a PSC. Yeah, so somebody just like in a hacker chat was just like code block like <laughs> GitLab so ATO bad. zero day. I was like, oh wow, okay. Um, so yeah, there there was a there's a little bit of buzz about this. I did some digging as well because um, there was some uh, there was the it was announced in there like release that there was a security patch and then obviously there was some buzz and whatever um there's a repo created for it eventually um and i managed to find the pr but the tldr uh for this is essentially when you go to reset someone's like you do a password reset or like a forgot password flow uh you in the parameters you know how in, in parameters you can like array them by putting like square brackets? Yeah, in XWW form URL encoded, you can kind of like do square bracket and then like square bracket or something like that in order to indicate an right. array, right? Yeah, either arrays or like in like key indexes basically. Mm, maps, yeah. Like you can you can do both of them. Um so you can do that basically if you do like user uh like the parameter user mm. and then the sub key email and then you make it an array and mm. the first value is like your target user email and the second value is your hacker email and that's it <laughs> and oh my god it was really really interesting i was actually looking through the code to, to try and understand how this works and it's a lot simpler um than it seems uh basically what happened is they were taking this parameter and they were sending the password reset option uh they were sending the, the password re reset to you know this email parameter mm. problem is it worked with an array like uh, by default so What's happening here is you're actually giving an array of two emails. The first mm. email is the valid email. The second email is your attacker email. And what it's doing is in the code, it goes you know through this whole flow and then it goes and it, it calls this function send password reset instructions to mm. email. And when it passes an email, it's actually sending it to an array of two emails. So mm. it sends the same email multiple, to two, two emails. Yeah, multiple right. two, two directives or whatever, yeah. Exactly, and so the first one, like, you know, it's gonna check like, is this a valid account, blah, blah, yes, it is because that's the first email, but the, the second, e when it sends out the email and it sends it to both addresses, now the attacker receives the password reset link for the victim, as well as the victim receiving the password reset link for the victim. One, I, I cannot believe that this existed in GitLab for so long and that this was like, because I've seen this technique before, you know, I, I've seen people do this before in the past. And one thing that's always kind of crazy to me is like, how, how does it know Oh, maybe the specific token is, or the specific user specified is different. I, I don't, I don't know. But like, how does it look at that array of emails or whatever and say, okay, the first one is the user that we're gonna, you know, take over the account for, and then the second one is the, you know, and then we're gonna send the email to both. Like, I feel like it should fail when it says, look up the user whose email is insert array here with two emails in it. You know, like I don't know. 
Yeah, it's super weird. Um, I was trying to find like I I I didn't get to like dig deep deep into how this mm-hmm. works because like when it sends a notification, it has this like type that it passes in like password reset instructions, and then yeah. it does some stuff. So I think it has some sort of like additional flow where it might have gone wrong here. But mm-hmm. the commit that they actually like changed to fix this initially, it's very very minimal. It literally just makes sure um, that it's explicitly pulling out like the the one it's email. verifying the email right yeah. Mm. yeah um and like you know se- before it sends it dude it's it's, it's crazy uh, yeah. to look at this ruby code man I, I don't know ruby just always throws me for a loop and it, I, I guess it they're using like it and then some string and then do and then to to like almost comment blocks on what it specifically does which is like one really cool for the for the impact of like or for the purpose of like uh documenting what the code is doing but it just makes it really weird to look at you know you're you're like is this an if statement is this an it statement it do statement like why is this so grammatically weird like so many questions yeah there's a lot of like weird ruby isms uh that are like uh you'll you'll like read a piece of code and it's very like you said it's very difficult to figure out what is like a variable or where's like a class or a reference is coming from and all that kind of stuff so um yeah, I was actually I was looking at this this file to see sort of mm. like where it came from. Yeah, um, and it seems that uh, this was some sort of new functionality that was added within the last year to okay. support password resets from uh, any verified email. So if you have multiple verified emails, then you can password reset your account from any of those verified ah. emails. It's just a single one. That might be what it is because it might be like okay, yeah. here's the account, and then here is the email I want to send. The interesting. Okay. Yeah. Very, yeah, very yeah, super, super interesting. Well, that's yeah. that's a pretty gnarly bug, man, and I can't believe how simple the POC was. It like fit in a short tweet, not like a long tweet, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. a like a very short tweet. Um, so that was that was cool to see. Um, and I spoke with a couple of my recon buddies, and uh, it seems like not a lot of things are popping with it actually, because you have to have a valid email associated with it, which shouldn't mm. be that much of a problem, I don't think. But um, from what I've heard, you know, people are, are getting on top of patching it and uh, there haven't been a lot of uh, public instances of it exploited, which is good to hear and sad to hear. You know, I don't know. Got that sort of pull of the heart in either way when you're a, a bug bounty hunter or offensive researcher. So, um, yeah, it absolutely. Is what it is. Um all right, so let, with that, let's go to the last news item of the day. This one was really exciting. Um, this is from Riley Goodside. He is a researcher um, on some AI stuff at Scale AI. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, we don't cover a lot of uh, AI related stuff here on the pod because it's just not a lot of technical content, to be honest. Like a lot of it is like, hey, let me convince this like semi, uh, you know, sentient thing to like do what I want it to do, um, yeah. it, you know, or render some markdown text or something, which is cool, you know, but it's not like uh, crazy um, until this came up, which I think was a really technical solution to a LLM um, related uh, vulnerability called prompt injection, which we've talked about in the past. Um, and essentially what it what it does is uh, Riley outlined the fact that LLMs are able to perceive Unicode tag characters, um, which are actually invisible characters uh, that represent all of you know the normal English characters you would use. Um, and so there you these are typically only used these tag characters are typically used um following a flag emoji in order to create the flag for a specific country so if you were going to do yep. the flag for the us it'd be flag and then the tag character u and the tag character s yeah um but since the llm is parsing it from a you know from a, a text perspective it's looking at the actual characters not how they're actually displayed yeah. it, it's actually able to read those and respond to those so you're able to smuggle invisible pieces of text into any llm mm. prompt that's super interesting the other place where i know that these are used mm. are for um the uh the skin tone modifiers oh on really emojis interesting yep. same thing 
Huh. Yeah. I, I, I hadn't seen that. So these seem like sort of like a, well, I mean, maybe like a tag or like an, a label, you know, for another emoji often used with Correct. other um, Unicode characters alongside other Unicode characters. And Riley actually figured out a way that we can actually just take over any prompt um, using these. So I, I think there's this is a pretty technical solution, um, which I was really impressed by. And then, of course, our boy Rezo jumped right on it and did a write up on it did a video on it that was really good explaining it, and also released a, uh, a Python script, a very short Python script that will allow you to take any input and convert it into tag characters um, with just a simple, um, you know, char conversion, uh, what is it, like 0xe0000 plus whatever the, the ordinal uh, number is for that specific character point. Um, so, yeah. so very cool approach here. I think the biggest, um, attacks that we'll see with this will be uh, embedding those invisible characters into text that will be placed into a prompt and uh, will bypass sort of a, a, the user and being able to see that they're actually pasting that text into the prompt and result in, in prompt injection or indirect prompt injection. Yeah, it's really interesting. This kind of reminds me of like the early days of like sandbox escapes because <laughs> this is like, you know, it's it's kind of a lot of what this is, which is right now, I don't think it, it feels like a lot of the AI companies haven't quite figured out the right way to like systemically deal with this stuff. So it's a lot of like, oh, shit, there's a hole here. There's a hole here. There's a hole here. And they're just running around sort of duct taping holes and like, mm -hmm. you know, putting temporary stuff in place and fixing things wherever they come up. And eventually, you know, a little bit down the line, they're going to figure out the right way to sort of deal with all the because this seems to be a pattern where it's like, you know, stuff that's to the human is like, oh, that like this is crazy because like I can't see this visibly. But like I think it's a little bit weird because what's going on here is like those characters are there. They're just not visible because they're not rendered by your browser or they don't mm -hmm. have like a text re representation right. or, you know, one way or another. And so I think there's a variety of different possible solutions that could go in place. You know, like you could make the browser render invisible characters or you could have your site not support invisible characters or... You know, yeah. the LM, like, you know, it rewrites your input message to show the invisible characters and say, or who knows? Like, I think there's a lot of different things, but none of them are super great. Um, yeah. But but it's, eventually we'll get to some more systemic systemic fixes, I think. It's a little bit tricky, you know, to fix this sort of thing at an LLM level, I believe. Um, we had some debates in the comments with uh, some random dude that was being very obstinate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and, but essentially saying, like, Rezo mentioned in here that it's it's very difficult to fix this because sure you can you can fix it at the API level but fixing it at the LLM level is going to be is going to be tricky because of how it perceives characters and and that sort of thing and and some of the good features of LLMs which is they inherently understand Unicode they inherently understand you right. know these characters that have circles in them you know or circles around them and that sort of thing so how do you discard right. some and discard the other um, besides right. doing it at the API level so that that'll definitely be an interesting problem for for those people to fix but for the time being i think there's a lot of a lot of cool applications here from a from an ai perspective and i'm sort of wondering if there's any other anything else that this could be used with um i imagine these characters will have unicode normalization happen to the actual characters in some scenarios so maybe there could be a situation where like um you submit an a a email you know, like you apply to be in an organization or something and the admin looks at your name, right? Or your, your, um, your email address and says, okay, uh, you know, this is clearly Justin at, you know, safe.com, but it's actually safe, you know, invisible character, invisible character.com. And then when they add me to the organization that Unicode gets normalized and it ad sends it to my evil domain or something like that, um, could be some interesting applications there from just a web app perspective as well. Mm, yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. So very, very, very good stuff there. Um, that's all I had from the news section. Um, with that, let us get into the topic of today's pod, which is vulnerable code patterns. So um, sort of uh, 
I'm not sure the order that these episodes are going to... I think the the order is that um, this one will come first. So in the future, there will be an episode where we're talking about WordPress uh, WordPress plugins and a bunch of like crazy bugs and stuff like that that I've been finding and and that uh, the WordFence team has been finding and, and uh, lots of discussions surrounding that. It's a very nuanced ecosystem and we provide you with a really great... Um, summary of how to look at that ecosystem quickly and find bugs that will affect your targets. So that's coming up. But with all of that knowledge that I had to get in order to do that episode, I did a shit ton of code review in PHP. Um, and so, uh, and I've been teaching this code review to a couple of my mentees and friends. Um, and I realized that there are some code patterns that are just really common that we kind of need to talk about in and get out there and get sort of um, frameworkized of sorts uh, before we actually, in order to be able to see them more easily when we look at code at a glance. Because you know, for the experienced eye, you look at a piece of code and almost in, in an instant, you can say, okay, this is the structure, this is the flow, you know, these are the conditions that need to be met. Um, and I think the more we can uh, frameworkize that, that thought, that intuition, uh, the better uh, code reviewers we're gonna be. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking we got. How many of these do we have, Joel? Let's see, one, two, three, four. Six, yeah, seven? seven, seven or eight, um, various different code patterns that I wanted to go through and just kind of discuss and talk about vulnerabilities surrounding those. Um, yeah. So, so, the, so the one, really quick, I, w I wanted to preface this because um, when you brought this up to me, I, I thought it was an interesting concept, um, and I think there's an there's some important nuance. Uh oh. To, uh oh. Uh, there, there's Joel's some got his fighting here. gloves on yeah. here. Hold on, let's go. <laughs> and I think like. I, I do want to encourage people to be like reading code and like looking for code patterns and like be able to identify that stuff. But I also want to encourage the mindset of context is key. Mm. Okay. And I think like that's really, really important because you can take all these snippets of code and you can put them in some random context that is not exposed to the internet or is not exposed to the world or just happens in a box in a silo. And it's completely, yeah, it's like not great coding practice, but it's not an issue. Mm. Um, and so I think being able to identify whether or not something's an issue is the real challenge yeah. here. Like, yeah, start the starting point is, is also tricky, but I think like, um, you know, this is sort of, it's not, it's not the equivalent, but it's, it's close to the equivalent of just like control F like eval. And then just like anywhere you see eval and like, yeah, eval's bad, but not always, right. um, you know, there, there are, there can be use cases or safe ways to use it or whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, these these patterns oftentimes can lead to things, but the the context is really important. Mm. Like, you know, if this isn't a plugin, like, is that is that flow exposed, or is this just something that happens in the background? Like, you know, how how is this being used? Is it yeah. you know, you one thing that you mentioned was uh, HTML decoding, right? And like, right. you see HTML decoding, and that's like was a really that was that before or after you called me a human semgrep instance, Joel? In our, in our <laughs> that <pre> was. <laughs> <laughs> that was before and then I said this is some grab um, <laughs> because yeah HTML decoding can be bad but like how's it being used no, right are no. they HTML decoding to log it in the console or are they HTML decoding it to put it in the HTML uh, yeah I mean 100% but like what I'm trying to highlight here is that there, there are some things that actively undo whatever you've just done. For example, let's just go ahead and jump to number two first. Sorry, sorry, editor sure. that has to, you know, maybe put up the little graphics or something like that. But um, we're going to jump to sanitization and then modification of data afterwards. The, the scenario that I had for this was you have an input parameter that you take from, you know, a query parameter or something like that. You run some sort of sanitization function on it, right? This is something that strips out HTML elements and that sort of thing, right? And then you immediately pass it to URL decode. That sanitization HTML function has done effectively nothing in that scenario because you, you can take everything that that function does and undo it by putting that in an encoded format that then gets decoded on the next line. So, so like whenever you have these sort of trades off, trade offs, it shows that the developer is not understanding something. And I think that's always a good and a good indicator of where a vulnerability might be, or at least a place to look a little bit closer. W wouldn't you agree? This, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, they're, they're good like starting points. I think. Um, yeah. This is kind of my like this is my big problem with semgrep like searching is that compared to something like CodeQL, which is more AST based, mm. um, 
it's looking for something that looks wrong, right? But it's not actually smart enough to tell whether it is wrong. And so it leaves a lot of that manual effort up to you. And it can be time consuming. Mm. I don't think it's bad. I just think it's like not the most efficient way to do stuff. Um, just kind of depends on what what is available for what you're doing. Like PHP, for example, there's no CodeQL support for PHP. Mm -hmm. So you can't use CodeQL for Unfortunately. that. So either you need, to, you need to write your own tool or... Um, just don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> don't look at me like that. Nerd snipe or, him. Or, Let's go. Or or you you sem grep it. Um, yeah. Yeah, but um, you know, san sanitizing HTML and then URL decoding. Um, I'm inclined to say that there are probably cases where that's not an issue, but I no. Joel, how could this not be an issue? If if there's if there's a a scenario where you either the sanitize HTML call shouldn't be there in the first place because it's not doing anything and it's wasting CPU cycles or it's a problem. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, not to say that it will result in an issue, you know, they could URL decode it and then say, compare it to a, you know, a string or something like that, and then make some decision based off of that, right? You're not going to be able to inject it or whatever, but in the first place, they shouldn't be HTML sanitizing it in that scenario because, if they're just going to compare it to a string anyway and then do some a action, it doesn't actually, ha there's no reason to decode it or to, to sanitize it in the first place. What uh, if they decode it and then sanitize the HTML? No, of course, that's the opposite way, right? That's the right way to do it. You you, you decode it and then you sanitize so that you can't well, What if there's another sanitized call after this? <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, I mean, well, you know, there is that possibility, but then that doesn't really fit the pattern. You know, the pattern is that it, you see some sanitization that occurs, and then afterwards you modify that data, and and that's just a dangerous place to be because, like even with, and we'll talk about another one later with with replace statements, but you know you you can you can affect the result of what you thought you accomplished with the sanitization call if you modify that afterwards, you know. Yeah, I think the big thing that I think modification is the wrong word. I think I think what you're trying to get at is like a reuse of attacker controlled data, right? So you're sanitizing it and then you're decoding that data again and it's still attacker controlled, right? If you're modifying it with something that's not attacker controlled, mod simply modification of data that's been sanitized, not necessarily an issue. If it's modification with attacker controlled data of attacker controlled data, right? It's about sort of like yeah. the chain of custody of the, of the data, right? Chain like of you custody still need of to the be, data. Right? I like that yeah. chain of custody of the data. That's good. Right. I, it's yeah. You want to be in, ensuring that like you're actually still in control here, right? Like, cause at a certain point, like it might pass through a function, like maybe it passes through sanitized HTML and it gets converted into an arbitrary PHP object. That's totally custom and it's not actually a string. And then when it URL decodes it, it like handles it separately or something like, mm. I don't know. Right. Like yeah. I think there are potentially s some instances, but that's like a really important thing to be looking for is like, where, like, do I still actually control this data like mm, throughout mm. these steps? Yeah, like, I agree. And, like and, custody. and there's definitely nuance to the situation, right? Like, like, um, like you said in the beginning, and I think your, your main point here is context is king and that you need to be able to, at the end of the day, POC or GTFO, what does it actually do to affect the application? What I'm trying to get the, uh, train my mentees to do and also to, um, this is an important part too. What I'm trying to formula, 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 formulate, formulate, yeah. form, formula, formula eyes. I don't know. It's, it turned into a formula. <laughs> is that is is that the word? I that is a real word. Yeah, it. I've got two second languages, man. I swear. Um, but uh, what I'm trying to turn into a formula in my brain is when I turn these into formulas, it makes my brain see them better, and it makes it, it be less intuition based and more principle based. And so that's what I'm trying to bring to the peeps here. Um, and and then also you know to have these trigger you to take a second look because when you're looking at a code base you're scroll you know you're scrolling through a ton of code your eyes are just blah, 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 you know like reading everything you need to know when to say yeah. oh that's something interesting and that's yeah. a very valuable skill in code review i think so yeah and i think like this is kind of like the nuclei or the HTTPX or whatever of like why do you keep comparing review. me to tools dude <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying no, no 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 let me let me let me expand because like basically those tools are really good at taking large 
inputs and helping you narrow down by like signal by like pointing out signals right like hey this host is online or this is running apache mm. or yeah um you know this is spring boot and here's the version and so you know like whatever like and i think this is kind of similar because you have too much to look at mm. like realistically you could read through every single line of every single plugin on wordpress and you could audit them all like that and that's fine i'll see you in 50 years yeah, like yeah. you know like it's you're never it's never gonna end like yeah um and so you really need a better way to sort of narrow it down which is kind of what we're talking about which is like yeah. you know okay i have this massive code base where do i even look uh you know here's like a couple interesting spots and these aren't guaranteed uh to be findings but they are good starting spots and maybe you'll find something else like you know along the way when you're looking at that but they're they're good sort of entry points to to you know easy sort of things to take a look at yeah and especially when code reuse is a part of it too you know like if this these flaws that i'm we're getting ready to describe here are in a function that is reused in multiple spots throughout the application then you can say hey okay this will result in a vulnerability in xyz scenario let's go see if this is ever used in that scenario and then you know you can kind of revert work backwards from that code reuse um starting point um right but yeah i i definitely agree with what you said about about using this sort of as a way to filter, you know, as an aquatone of sorts. Now we got screenshots. Now we got, you know, is the host alive sort of scenario rather than, right. all right, let me go knock on the door of every single port. Um, right, right. So with that, all right, let's go back to, up to the first one. The first one is uh, auth check inside the body of an if statement. So this is something that I've seen like <laughs> a stupid amount. Uh, it's kind of funny, but like if there's an if statement and then your auth check is inside of that if statement, obviously you can if you can control the condition of the if statement, you can absolutely run whatever is outside of that if statement or in the else statement. Um, and so whenever I see an auth check inside of an if statement where the condition is user controllable, I'm always like, wait a second, why? Wh what's going on there? And I always look a little bit deeper. Yeah, yeah. And so from like a developer perspective, I think like there's a couple of different instances. It's not always bad thing. Like sometimes it's, you know, you want it to happen only in a certain case and you want everything else to still happen. Yeah. So like maybe it's normal. Intentional functionality, um, yeah. Yeah, and it also could be that um, there's this this coding practice called de-denting where basically instead of, um, you know, if you imagine this if statement, if you flip it and you do if not get and then you call do something else and then otherwise you're calling, you know, check off, you can sort of flip your if statement and you can do certain logic inside the if statement and then just, you know, after the if statement, you just do everything else. Right. Um, inside of check off, you know, theoretically, there's a return statement here somewhere or an, mm -hmm. or an exception or something yeah. that's supposed to cause the outer function to break out in a in a bad case. Mm -hmm. Realistically, maybe probably not doing that. I mean, looking at this code, it certainly doesn't okay. seem like it's being caught anywhere. This is just a little bit of code I wrote so that I can help you visualize, you know, what we're talking yes. about. But actually, I've got an idea, Joel. Here's what we're going to do for the rest of this episode, okay? We're, this is we're going to turn this into another versus episode. We're going to uh, we're going to okay. we're going to turn this into a hacker versus developer episode. The right way and the wrong way. Yeah, <laughs> okay. and, and we're going to say, "Okay, Justin says this is a vulnerable code pattern." And Joel says, "Well, there's there's a little bit of nuance to that situation." So, you know, <laughs> to do this <laughs> yeah it's called de-denting you know and, and yeah so, de-denting no that is an interesting practice though and it definitely does make your your um uh you, it can make your code more readable and and shorter when you have you say okay is this just a massive if statement should i just invert this put everything else on the yeah. outside and then make a short if statement that catches the scenario yeah. and exits if it needs to um right but that exit is like the key right like th mm. th in order for you to be able to de-dent successfully it has to essentially exit it has to bail out and mm. so if that bailout behavior is not done properly or if it's like supposed to be handled in a different function it's not mm. being handled in a different function then it's not gonna bail out right well, and that, it's just gonna keep going it's so. funny if you look at number four now check for bad patterns with an if statement but then don't do anything to the control flow. That's exactly what we're talking yeah. about there. This is a scenario where essentially you look, there's an if statement that's clearly used for security purposes. Um, and then you know, inside the if statement, they're supposed to be handling that bail, that bailout, that error. But sometimes they just like set a set a variable to true or something like that, and then never do anything else with it later, and the code continues on anyway. Um, that's another bad pattern that I've seen, and that's exactly what you're talking about, Rachel. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a, justific <laughs> a justification for that one other than like you know, 
<laughs> humans like yeah. uh, developers are humans too and uh, the reality is that uh just like everybody else they started something and forgot to finish it or uh, you know they, they had a plan and and it, one way or another the code still worked and uh it, yeah. it was inconsequential the way they were testing it <laughs> the but, test case uh, passed, being you know? later. yeah 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 so that, that's another one to, to take a look for you know whenever they're bailing or whenever there's an exiting strategy in place making sure that that's actually killing the control flow of the application um, will result in in you know some some valid code versus if it's not killing it if it's setting a variable then you still got to continue to trace that flow even though they've detected something bad and they're on to us uh, there still could be things that you could do especially if there's a sync in between you and the the you know death that inevitably occurs due to your bad input yeah um, yeah so. or maybe they're they they have that check and they set bad equals true and then they do something with it but what they do with it isn't right or they or it's mm. not meaningful or it's right? too late. Like, yeah, or the, yeah, exactly. Like maybe they do something else with your vulnerable data and it's, you know, the bad check is already, you know, hasn't happened yet. Yeah, exactly. All right. What do, do you uh, do you want to pick uh, up any of these or, or no, 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 we'll, we'll do it this way and I'll I'll say it and then you can you can comment on it. So next one, okay. next one on the list is bad regex. I'm interested to see how you could. Uh... <laughs> this is a losing battle. I, I, how am I supposed to defend someone I, not escaping a dot in a regex? I, I, set, I set you up for failure here. Um, but yeah, so this next one is sort of a, uh, a regex based one, which is you know, anytime you see regex, to be honest, for, for any of you that are scared of regex and that have not taken the dive to understand regex fully you will get such an roi on this if you just deep dive yeah. regex and understand it thoroughly because so many people yeah. try to use regex for sanitization and for security and man is it tricky to do right um so definitely and not, not only that like i use regex for a lot of things mm -hmm. i mean i use regex all the time for like just developer flows oh, yeah. or like pulling data out of you know pipe a pipe like piping data through bash and stuff mm -hmm. it's like pulling different data points out and stuff or manipulating data and all that kind of stuff. I use regex all the time. Like regex is such a valuable tool and the syntax is not difficult. No, like it's, it, not. it's a little bit daunting at first. Um, we've talked about this before, probably regex 101.com. I freaking love that Amazing website. site. Like yeah. literally just take a regex, put it in the website and then look on the right side. There's a, there's a section called explanation and it literally walks you through every single part of the regex and says, here, this does this. It's looking and it in layman's English terms explains exactly what that part of the regex is doing. And then it goes to the next part and says, this is looking for this. And this character does this modifier and it's looking for this, 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 and this. Amazing tool. Great. Very useful for learning regex and understanding like what is this thing I'm looking at actually doing. The other side of that is you can use this, start writing your own regex and in the test string, just like put your own data in there and just mm -hmm. start writing a regex and be like, how do I select this data? I, you know, I want to select because it. it highlights you know, the data text. you've selected too, yeah. and it's like, oh, ah, yeah, it this shows is you so visually. easy. Ugh. Yeah, um, you know, definitely, I'd recommend taking some time learn about regex. There's a lot mm. of tools out there. Um, there's another tool. We'll link it. I don't. Uh, I'll have to find it. Um, uh, this regex is your this strings. is your regex yeah. strings tool. Yeah, we've talked about yes. this I think once before on the pod. It's that's a great tool too. I haven't used it quite as much. Uh, I did put the um, I did put the regex one hundred and one in the link section by the way. Oh, cool. Um, awesome. But yeah, so you can drop that down there as well. Regex to strings is also really cool. It'll it'll give you strings that match your regex. Um, very helpful. With regards to what yeah. actually things you should be on the lookout for when you look at a regex. Um, Obviously, there's this concept of dots in regex meaning, meaning any character. And man, did the stars align when people decided to make that the dot any character and make dots the separator in domains. Um, yeah. One of the things that I just relish in my life, like that sort of good luck for attackers. So anytime you see an unescaped uh, dot in a URL-based regex or in a domain-based regex, you can pretty much guarantee that there's something you need to look into there he's you like that yeah. joel did you like i, I didn't no, say no, that's, that's good i didn't say that there's any you know that there's guaranteed there's a vuln there there's definitely something that you need to look into there yes absolutely look into that and the other thing um that's mentioned here is like the missing of the carrot and the dollar sign which indicate mm -hmm. the start and end of line um depending on the context of the data that's being passed in for the match it might be doing a regex search on you know, everything, mm. the whole input or whatever non-filtered part. And so if it's not specifically saying, I want the whole 
match to start here and end here, mm. then you can match data within other pieces of text that may be completely irrelevant. So you can, you know, a good example is, you know, www.example.com.attacker.com. Yeah. Right. And, it, and it's only looking for www.example.com or we have github.com on here. But, um, yeah. you know, if it's only searching for that and it's not checking for the end of the line, then you can have stuff after it and before it that can change the context of that data and be used in different ways. Yeah, 100%. And so that that's a big one to look at, the, the start and the ending. Another one is that a lot of times people just won't think about all of the possibilities from a character perspective. So we talked in the past yeah. about... Um, what parts of the URL have what impact uh, on on you know what host the request will be routed to in the end? We've got those the at sign that allows us to add characters before the uh, the actual domain is is specified. That can be really helpful. Um, and then uh, we've also got in the context of URLs, we've got slashes that you, you can use backslashes instead of slashes. Um, and a lot of time the browser will natively convert those or any um, request sending tool, you know, curl and that sort of thing will will convert them as well a lot of times. So um, yep. you really want to think about the edge cases, the breadth of possibilities you have from a, pers uh, a character set perspective. And then also, I this is sort of only tangentially related, but I ran into a situation where this was helpful the other day. You know, some servers will just accept the full path in URL encoded format. So you could just, you know, percent two F ABC, percent two F, you know, one, two, three, you know, blah, 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 like that. You don't even have to have slashes in there. Um, and so that's another thing is, you know, even if their code isn't doing URL decoding, you may be able to affect the back end by sending those URL encoded characters directly to the back end if you're in sort of like an SSRF or secondary context sort of situation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and one thing I was I was thinking about as you were describing that, yeah. Um, well, two two things. One, with the you know they might their regex may be a little too broad in terms of what they're expecting, so maybe they use dot star right mm. or something like as just yeah. like a filler right. That's that's pretty common. People use dot star meaning any number of any character, but you know, infinite uh, from zero to infinite. Um, and the regex uh, to string tool that I that will link down below is a great tool for that because you can take a regex and you can put it in there and you can see all the different possibilities and that will really easily identify like hey here's like a weird spot where you can put a bunch of different characters or here's a spot where there can be sort of infinite possibilities of things in between um and and that makes it really useful um Oh, what was I going to say? <laughs> well, I, I think I had it. Well, I don't know where you were going to go, but where I was going to go after you were done going with where you were going to go was, <laughs> um, and there's nuance too to the star and the plus sign, right? You know, in, in that scenario, yeah. you know, if you're using dot star, then you can just ignore that whole part if you want to because zero, it matches the, yeah. the thing zero Nothing. times. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times people will also use star when they should be using plus to make sure that there's at least one instance of, of the thing, one to infinite yeah. instances um, versus zero to infinite instances. So that's another sort of gotcha in that scenario. Does that, does that trigger what you were going to talk yes, about? Or is I, it I remember okay, now. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't related to that, but um, one thing that we talked about in a recent episode was the Franz uh, Rosen XSS challenge and this was very related to regex specifically and yeah. and specifically javascript like regex replacement group mm -hmm. name like special naming things um so that's another thing to keep in mind with regex specifically in the context of javascript i don't know about other languages if they have support for it to that full extent um like those different replacement groups but uh, I know that the, the JavaScript uh, regex replacement has all these special capture groups that uh, Franz pointed out in his XSS challenge that can be super that's, useful. That's a great point, dude. Man, I, like this was just so cool to see that you could actually insert these strings in the in the response. So you can say, you know, things that match before things before the match that we have, things after the match. Mm -hmm. So freaking cool. Um, I cannot wait to exploit this more. And I'm glad you brought it up again because it sort of refreshes that neural pathway a little bit and it makes it sure it's in the forefront of your head rather than, you know, being being further yeah. back. Because uh, that's such a cool thing. I'm going to add it to the list here. Capture groups. Let's yeah, see. absolutely. Capture groups. All right. Last one on the, on the regex list was multi-line stuff. Um, sometimes depending on the regex configuration, uh, and actually I should add, uh, I should add capital capitalization here. 
uh, capitalization and multi-line, both of those are things that are sort of um, flags in most languages that you can kind of turn on, like, do I ignore case? Do I do this on a multi-line match? Um, and so if there, if there is an opportunity for multi-line input uh, and they're running something that just goes through the first line, then you may be able to smuggle in a payload there. Um, or if there's something that they're expecting to be a certain capitalization and you can flip the case, then uh, it may miss that regex and uh, result in you being able to do some cool stuff. So those are some other things to keep in mind from the regex perspective. Anything else to add there, yep. Joel? No, I mean, I, I was just going to say regex 101 supports the flags um, in your regex thing. There's a little, you click the little, It's I think it's by default, it says GM. G for global, M for multi-line, but it has a dropdown of all the different flags that you can use and you can check them and it gives an explanation of how they work. Um, you know, we won't go too deep into all of the nuances of regex, but I again, I'd really encourage, go to regex 101 and check out um, regex if you haven't Take, taking a deep dive into how that works and uh, it's definitely worth learning. Yeah, one, one, one more piece there, you know, since we're fanboying over Regex 101 <laughs> right now. Um, it, it's definitely the best idea to select as granularly as you can the language on the left-hand side in the flavor section, um, especially when you're looking for exploitation because there are sp specific nuances to various different languages that you may be able to, you know, pull out of there if you're actually using the correct <laughs> playground for your regular expression evaluation and, and toying. Um, so definitely don't forget to do that as well. Um, all right, next one on the list. We already did the bad, the bad uh, pattern one, so we're going to jump down to the next one. Oh, I love this one. This is replace statements for sanitization. Um, the, you know, replace statements for sanitization are helpful only in a scenario where you are replacing one character. Uh, it, 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 when you're re replacing a sequence of characters, obviously you can just sort of sandwich the thing in the middle, get something replaced, and then you, if it's not recursive, you won't, it, you know, you can get the same flow of characters in there. So the classic example is dot, 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 so four dots, slash, slash, whatever, right? And when they do a dot dot slash replacement on that, it'll remove the dot dot slash in the middle and the two dots on the left-hand side and the slash on the right-hand side will then become dot dot slash. Um, and so it, since it's not recursive, you will just get the, that result in, in your uh, resulting payload and be able to easily bypass any um, replace-based uh, stuff and, and and one of the things I've seen some things do like for example the sanitization functions in WordPress core I was auditing those recently um, they will put annoying characters there instead of just replacing it to nothing uh, you know they'll put an underscore like a squiggly sign or something like that and it's like well that hex up the whole situation so if you see any any sanitization where the thing that they're replacing with um, is a is nothing. Uh, then you might be ha able to do, and the thing that they're replacing is more than one character, then you may be able to do something funky there. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was going to say like the recursive aspect that you mentioned is a pretty big caveat there. Like definitely like if, I think almost all of these, if you just put it in a, you know, while loop that checks if it had any replacements and then mm you know, exits out whenever it's done replacing, that would fix it, right? Like if you mm -hmm. did a dot, dot slash and you just kept replacing until it didn't replace anymore, problem solved. Um, True. But, you know, it's, it can be very difficult. And the context, I think, you know, this is something that's not context aware, right? So like the big issue of replacing a dot, dot slash is that, that it's not context aware. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't know what's around it. It doesn't know how it's being used. And so like trying to do that generically is kind of difficult. Um, you know, if you say, I don't want a dot, dot slash, anywhere then you can recursively replace it easy mm. um but that that's you know not always easy so yeah i like that one that's a that's a good one another nuance while i'm thinking of it is that um by default in javascript uh dot replace is the first match only uh, so if you take a string mm. and you do string dot replace uh in javascript it only replaces the first instance the right way to replace every instance is that you're supposed to do string dot replace with a regex that global matches. <laughs> it's really it's very weird. Yep. One, two, three, space, one, two, three, replace one, two, three with squiggly. Check that out. Huh. You know, I know I've seen that before, but I don't know that I've 
done. Okay, so there's actually a replace all function as well um, in JavaScript oh, okay. that will do all of them. Um, okay. But uh, the single replace, man, okay. Anytime auditing JavaScript, let me just get this in my head. Come on, I got to turn it into a formula in my head. Anytime you see dot replace in a JavaScript scenario, alert alert in the brain yes. okay I, yeah, the first parameter has to be like a global regex for it to actually replace all the instances very interesting i have uh now stored that in the hacker brain it's gonna stay there forever now awesome very good um all right let's see we oh okay so then we've got this super weird one okay so this next one is anything that allows you to call functions or control code flow in an abstract or uncommon way, okay? And I know that that's really out there, but it should make sense after I'm done explaining it, okay? So PHP does this super whack thing where you can call strings. And it's so dangerous. Yes. <laughs> it's so dangerous. And I Actually, this is one of my favorite features of PHP, but keep going. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I I'm very excited to hear about that uh, afterwards. Uh, but this has resulted in multiple criticals for me over the past uh, couple months. And um, essentially, this sort of functionality is just extremely dangerous. For example, one of the common code patterns I'll see is they'll say um, in, in PHP, this, you know, meaning the current class, arrow, and then some string variable that you can control, and then call the function that's associated with that string variable and pass in something like the entire request, uh, you know, dollar sign underscore request, which contains all of your parameters. It's a map that contains all of your parameters that you've defined for the request directly into that function. Um, and so, there's just so many weird things you can do with this. Um, I can't. I couldn't believe it when I saw this. You know, actually coming up a couple times. It was really weird. But in in order to make this a more general statement, I, I, I'm trying. Uh, I want. I want to emphasize that any sort of functionality in the app that will allow you to arbitrarily call functions, even in a limited context. Um, pretty weird, and should kind of set alarm off and make you investigate further. Yeah, I think it. Standard languages, this would be like reflection. You know, if you see like reflection somewhere that's like pulling a method by a name and then later calling it or, you know, like yeah. that, that's kind of weird behavior. And this is what a lot of that is. Um, this is one of my favorite PHP features because it's uh, it's from a developer side. It's great. Like, oh you know, my gosh. It, uh, it adds a lot of flexibility into your code because normally yeah, a lot of flexibility. Like, that's one way to put it. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, like the, 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 the real way that you do this. Uh, otherwise is like you call eval and evals gross you yeah know? so instead you get to do this like without calling eval, eval. It's, <laughs> yeah it's secret eval the method has to exist you know but uh, uh but it's like yeah you can you it, it's nice because for like deterministic code basically you can have multiple functions and then you can just be like this variable equals you know this function name otherwise this variable equals this other function name and then you call it and it you know there, there is a use case, but uh, oh, man. it's pretty limited. Yeah, flexible, flexible code for sure. Yeah. Lots of wiggle room in there, and lots of yummy yeah. wiggle room for the attackers. Um, yeah. No, it, it is a cool feature though, and it is very convenient. And I've seen some very, um, I guess, efficiently written code flows uh, within the plugins that I've audited because of that. All right, last one on the list is sort of a type uh, type confusion sort of scenario. And I couldn't really figure out a way to generalize this uh, super duper well. Um, but if you're dealing with languages that are not doing static typing, then you should always constantly be thinking, hey, can I get another data type in here? You know, what happens if I turn this thing that they're expecting to be a string into an array? You know, and, and or what happens if I if I you know try to make them access the index of a array versus an object or an object versus an array, right? Um, there's just a lot of flexibility here with type confusion bugs, and we talked about this a lot with Matthias on the episode in December, um, and we can see sort of the GitLab bug that we discussed at the beginning of this episode very much resembles that, right? They're expecting that email to be a string, and the fact that it was an array caused mass havoc for the GitLab team. Um, so anytime you see non-static typing on user controlled stuff, that should set off a flag to, to just investigate a little further. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, not only is this good for like debugging, like, um, from a non like coded auditing perspective, we talked about this a little bit mm, where mm. you can, you can fuzz 
like different data types and parameters to get the server to talk back mm -hmm. essentially mm -hmm. yeah um and that's really useful but also you know like this like the type confusion type stuff where a lot of languages that are not strictly typed or even if they are strictly typed they have to convert the, the input the inbound data into a strict data type mm -hmm. and so in order to do that they have to manipulate the data one way or another and that leaves some gaps for how that data is being interpreted between like when it's being sent and how the server is actually handling it mm. and so i think depending on you know the language depending on whether or not it's typed depending on how it's being some languages deserialized some you know automatically convert everything to strings you know, it's definitely worth looking into seeing what it's expecting and trying to fiddle around with some other data types and see what it does. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And, and one of the scenarios that I, that I think that this comes up the most in is an int sort of situation, an integer for an ID, right? The, the person yeah. has named the parameter record ID, right? And they use that they assume that it's going to be an ID in whatever context they're in, um, and they, but or, and that it's going to be a number, and that, that they haven't done you know that int uh, typing, uh, forced typing. Um, what 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 am I trying to say here? Forced typing. What what is uh, casting? Yeah, casting. Thank you. I couldn't yeah. get that. <laughs> I couldn't get the word. <laughs> they haven't done that casting, right? Um, and then you know you provide a string, and if they inject you know in injected into like a URL context on the back end, secondary context bugs. It's, that's a, that's like the bread and butter for secondary context bugs. And then um, also, you know, this can cause problems in SQL context as well, traditionally. Um, and then th the last thing that I wanted to mention here is that there's a whole type of bug class surrounding this sort of thing that I think is not super really talked about that I've been finding a lot of stuff related to lately, which is you give it a, a type that it doesn't understand and they don't expect that, and it causes an error somewhere in the code, and it just breaks the whole thing, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you can turn, uh, this is an example, literally like 10 minutes before we started recording, uh, Menti came up to me and said, hey, I've got this C-surf, I can affect this really sort of benign thing, doesn't really impact the application very much. And I looked at it, and I was like, hey, what if we just give it some sort of, what if we just give it Astiff? You know, like what happens then? And we did, and it just like broke the whole page, <laughs> and, and which is the wow. most important page on that whole app. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, you go from like having this very minimal impact vulnerability to a type confusion to, wow, everything panics and everything's broken, and now the page does nothing. Mm, mm, that's super, super good. I love, I love that that sort of immediate impact of, uh, of being able to show the the type confusion. Yeah, uh, into something meaningful. Yeah, yeah. DOS is a really, really good playground for that. All right, man. That's all I had on my list. Any other ones come to mind from you from all of these? Or I think I think we hit a pretty comprehensive list. Yeah, I think we hit a pretty good list. You know, as we mentioned, these are like good starting points. They're not explicitly mm -hmm. bugs, but they're 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 a good way to sort of narrow down your focus. And um, you know, as you were sort of doing during this episode, mm -hmm. I think it's good. Like as you read through code, identify those problems, formulate them store them in your brain, figure out what like weird things look like, and then you'll start to see more weird things. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well said, man. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and cut it. That's the awesome. pod. That's the pod.